Francis Hunt from the market sniper.com joins us today to talk about the 50 year fluke and what it means for gold and silver. This and more on this week's episode of Metal Money. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Francis Hunt, welcome to Metal Money. How are you doing? Hey, glad to be with you, Patrick. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Francis. Appreciate the time that you've given us here. You know, last year was a great year for both metals, in particular gold hitting all-time highs. And since then, both metals have pulled back somewhat, but silver seemingly more resilient than gold, yet unable to hold that $28 price target. Are you seeing anything in your technical analysis where a precious metals consolidation is happening for an upward move? Yes. So, Patrick, good question. The $28 has significance um, for a number of reasons. Uh, it was the floor very much during the previous uh, highs of uh, the great descending triangle. So I will show that to you um, technically if we just pivot to a share screen uh, to capture the events of 2011 that gave the high up to 49. What many people might not recognize, and I'll just do a quick overlay draw here uh, in bright transient pink, is that there was a sort of floor that occurred in and around there at that 28 number. This was what we typically call technically a descending triangle. So again, uh, those tops were getting capped and sold off down and you had a flat bottom floor, which you held for a while before eventually that relented. And we went into a, um, a medium to long-term bear or pullback in a macro bull, uh, depending on your time frame. And as a result, we're now bumping up against that on the way back up, um, which is a encouraging because it's the beginning of a recovery on your macro uh, uh, time frame. But the 28 has proven a little bit of a stern uh, resistance for now. Um, a lot of it will have to do with a combination of golds, uh, golds progress. Um, silver was more resilient during the pullback, but it's important to highlight, as many will know, that gold actually made a new high while silver got on its bike a lot lower. And the big aspect here was the super low that was smashed out around about the $11 uh, during the events of um, the pandemic. We, uh, we of course, uh, pivoted to a very strong gold bull at that point and an oil short because we do a lot of cross-market analysis across a number of things. In fact, I've got a couple of charts with quite visual that I'll be showing you uh, shortly in terms of all of that. So uh, whilst the short term, there's clearly some degree of re uh, resistance and you could even have a poke below this line uh, for a little bit. I think silver is uh, setting up to catch up. Um, one of the charts we often look at with relation to that is the gold silver ratio though so i'll take you quickly to a live uh, version of that and highlight that for now gold is having a little bit of a bump when we put on our draw level the biggest key level there was the 70 you've fallen out of the 70 our ta um taking that off um was very much that this was a rising wedge over here now for those of you that are not familiar with a rising wedge it's kind of a squeezing lower volatility squeezing higher and that was pretty bearish uh, in essence, you don't want this chart to go up, you want it to go down. This led to the final capitulant low uh, of the $11 of silver that actually saw you cross over 128, uh, depending on which gold silver prices you had, 26, 128. And that was our big macro call. We've never been so high. And it's quite typical, a very important technical element is that you often have a final capitulation before as a bookmark end for a major trend. Uh, in other words, a final capitulation in the silver markets to the downside that was lagging gold, a final blow off top on the gold silver ratio, which as many people will know is inversely correlated. So you wanted this to top, you wanted it to reverse, and we were calling the gold bull there. Uh, with gold being the main driver, um, but with silver slowly starting to catch up. And now we're kind of hanging at the 70, which is, a, if, if you look through the price behavior, it roughly is the modern era's key level, round about that. You've been a bit above, you've been a bit, a, a, a bit below. What I'd like to do, though, is actually take you out to a couple of macro charts, because one of the difficult things, and I'm a I'm precious metals bull, but I'm particularly silver fan. Um, one of the most difficult things is you need almost to have the patience of a monk, as I was describing uh, 
um, earlier in terms of uh, silver. This truly is the long-term trend and it's going to be something that's eventually going to come, but people have to keep going. I am going to put it to you, um, let's, get a, let's get something a little bit headline-ish out for you, is that is there some form of a discount window being held open for the Eastern market uh, on account of maybe, let's just hypothesize now, I'm just shooting the breeze, we're spitballing together um, with, say, China, sitting with a trillion of American debt, probably going to get written off. It's going to definitely underperform in terms of real yield. So according to inflation and proliferation of fiat, the rates that's being paid, it's a guaranteed underperformer. Assuming there's no debt jubilee that subsequently sees it written off, it's a guaranteed loser. And in fact, before we uh, pivot to that, I want to actually highlight another chart um, that we have uh, that highlights actually the last time we had similar circumstances like that gold was illegal to own so if I just show you this chart over here you will see the negative the negative let's go with a different color but stronger the negative real interest rates as uh, on debt this was now 30s post the depression all the way into um, the, the, the end of the Vietnam war Gold was illegal to own during that period, and that is when 10-year treasury note yields and real returns were negative. We are coming back down. This chart needs updating. We've been coming right back down. We're in the negative again. So this is one of the dangers, is that they don't want you to own the protection um, when you need it most. Very much like banks that lend to you when you don't need the money. Uh, it's kind of like give you a brolly when it's uh, shining and take it away when the rain comes. Uh, and that's quite typical uh, policy. But going back to the East versus West, um, the 50-year fluke, as I like to call it, something that should be examined uh, really closely is the following. And I, I, I'm surprised more people don't talk about this. Um, so this will play to those that are open to the fact that there's certain degrees of uh, manipulation. Um, as I say, we're not trying to get cranky here, but there's certainly something that needs to be answered here. And I'm just going to maximize this so that it's nice and clear for you. There's three lines on there. The silver price um, is the uh, red line. But it is an aggregate. It is broken down by two, sub, uh, two different lines. Uh, these two lines are buying at the open in the American session and selling at the close. And then the other one is buying at the close, holding overnight till the next open and closing. So that is your 24 hour silver market split into two. So you're actually getting two opposing charts of relative performance. And the question I have to ask about this is how's it that buying at the close of the American, the blue line, New York overnight silver index based at 100 right back in 1970, guys. This isn't a once-off fluke. We're talking about the 50-year fluke that if you did this, and I'm almost irritated I haven't got a bot on out there doing exactly this and compounding silver ounces for me, um, is your gold value, and I will take this into log scale later, but I just needed you to see the regular scale to see the absolute difference and variance in performance than the guy who buys the American Open and sells the clothes. He gets absolutely destroyed, the black line. So the red line is actually the aggregated summary of the black line and the blue line. That is your silver price um, and the split into two sessions. So for me, it's become quite clear that there's a certain degree of a discount window for a certain time zone that occurs. Um, you don't get flukes or coincidences that last for 50 years. It is non-random. It is statistically significant. I defy anybody who understands probabilities and permutations to just tell me um, anything otherwise. If we just look at that with a log scale so that you can actually see the values on that chart, because this is probably one of the most interesting, uh, I think, revelations that can be brought out uh, for your show, is that once we, de once, once we put it in a log scale, you can actually see those values. I'll again just make it a tad bigger for uh, presentation purposes. So one number starts at 100 in 1970 and has taken you well through 10,000 on the way to 11. The other that started at 100 is barely above 10, has lost 90% of its value. And it's the same commodity, just bought at different times. That is insane. And that gives you your aggregated return so far for silver. What's going on? Why does one half of the planet sell the paper price down and the other half utilize that? 
I'm assuming for potentially purchasing in real markets. Who knows? You can speculate at your own um, to your own degree as to why that might be. But for me, that's one of the biggest questions that has got to be answered. That 50 year chart definitely did show a lot. But within that, I I suppose you're saying that there may be some some funny stuff going on. And, and if there is, how does then a, a chartist account for these things that, that go on in order to to call a probability? Absolutely. It's a good question. And many people that think they debunk the notion of following the money through charts will make the following statement. Um, it's all manipulated. Therefore, your chart is, is meaningless. You're reading riddles and tea leaves in the sand um, type narrative. I want to just uh, take those that think that up very, very clearly up. All participants are captured in the market, including central banks and any other participants. So we can highlight multitude of, um, uh, of events where we have traded um, with or against what turned out to be central bank activity. I mentioned to you prior to this, the Euro Swiss franc collapse in 2009 that preceded the Greek crisis and all the European banks. We shorted at 150. We could see exceedingly low volatility kept being drawn down to this level. That was a soft, unannounced floor that they were trying to hold. Already, Germans were moving money off um, out of euros into Swiss banks, Italians, et cetera, et cetera. And there were flows. And they were trying to stem that tide. You can see it. And the central bank was holding a line. They created an unnatural wall on the beach, which inevitably sees sand stack up against it. And inevitably, you don't hold back the tide. We shorted that right down to below one. They then came in and put in a known where they spoke about it and said, we will intervene. In fact, they already were. We could see that price behavior. So all actors show up in price behavior, including ones that some people would consider nefarious or black hat actors or gray hat ha actors, not uh, traditional price discovery mechanism actors. So all actors are captured in price movement. Insiders, um, central banks, uh, all the participation is there, plus volume. So charting is actually the forensic detective. That's a great point there. I mean, you showed us that 50-year chart. You've even talked about how there are actors involved and how you can find them in the, the technical analysis. You can find the forensics there. So with all of these things into account, what are you seeing as the next significant resistance and support levels that you're seeing for silver and gold? So on a more, so I've, I've spoken on the macro. I'm not mm -hmm. going to tell you what you want to hear on the smaller time frames. Uh, I'm afraid to say I want to be the guy that brings good news. Technically, um, I think there's still scope for a, a, a little stab down um, on silver. Uh, we are in a bit of a ascending triangle, um, and we had quite an abrupt uh, rejection at the 28 at the last time. So this is with the supposed narrative um, of the Federal Reserve doing a taper and cutting uh, back balance sheets and various other things. That to me is a fake narrative. Um, they won't be able to do anything meaningful on any sustained basis. But for now, they will currently potentially create some degree of deflationary concern, um, which is adverse for precious metals. So short term, um, I think you should treat this as an accumulation window. The one thing that has shown as a clear area of, of support, as I'm looking at the chart with other eye, is if you can get at around 23 to 24 range and even up to 24, 24 and a half on dip downs, that just proves sensible accumulation zone. That, uh, I'm not going, I'm not calling that the 28 falls just yet because technically it doesn't look like it. Um, that said, Gold has done slightly better on its recent form. We're, you know, we're talking now it's the 12th of July. If I look at the gold chart, it's managed to reclaim the 1800s after its slap in the face post the, the Fed announcements, which I think is a little bit of an overreaction and a bit of optimism by Wall Street. But, you know, maybe they seize those narratives to suppress the market a little bit. Who knows? Um, but uh, the gold-silver ratio is actually creeping up slightly. Um, but this is a kind of a counter-trend rally in what is a major corrective down. The, so I'm all my optimism I'm going to give the people are more on the medium and long term. Can I say... The bigger the move to the upside on the gold-silver ratio, the greater the subsequent reaction to the downside. And I wouldn't put it past the possibility, this is someone who said you might get single-digit oil. You could just make a dip under 
the 10 and get a single digit gold a silver ratio if we had the 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 fullness of the move was allowed to play out your last gold silver bull market was a truncated one one of the charts i showed you just show, you could see it didn't get anywhere near as far as um the 80s the late 70s into the early 80s uh, in terms of progress so the fact that we've gone so far and got such a distortion shows how everything's become financialized and if you hold the long term this could be very very uh, beneficial and often the suppression to the downside will cause a mania hyper emotion and you could actually get single digit gold silver ratio which could see you know quite big numbers triple digits for silver uh, and gold uh, you know say safely three, four, four, five, and beyond um, in that amount. So both bullish for both of them, but particularly silver. So the long term, stay the course. Short term, you're not going to get immediate gratification right now from me just yet. All right, Francis Hunt, we appreciate everything that you've said. I think you've opened up a lot of our eyes and and we're now seeing a quite of a bigger picture here. So we appreciate that. And we definitely want to get you on again soon. Hey, that's great. I've enjoyed being with you, Patrick. Uh, good luck and all strength to you guys um, getting the message out there. Truly appreciate it. There you go. Francis Hunt from TheMarketSniper.com, keeping his sights on the markets and on precious metals. As always, leave your thoughts in the comment section below and remember to keep it liquid, keep it real. And I'll see you on the next episode of Metal Money.